want to start on the macroeconomics and, and matter with you. Mm -hmm. uh, how does Standard Chartered's internal research chime with the ABD's outlook for developing Asia? Sure. So actually, we've just uh, released our own quarterly publication uh, called The Global Focus uh, day before. And in that, I think we're quite similar in terms of expectations uh, for the global economy. Uh, I think um, really Asia for us continues to be the main driver of global growth. Uh, looking for 6% growth, uh, slightly maybe above consensus on expectations for China. We're looking for 6.4% uh, 6 growth there because of the kind of fiscal stimulus that has come through. Um, we've called our global focus the dovish wave and really reflects the change in sentiment that has happened since the market uh, tantrum that we saw in December, especially in terms of the central banks. So the Fed, in our view, has turned positively more dovish. Uh, it has signaled that it's, it's turned a lot more dovish. And so now we expect no more rate hikes in this cycle from the Fed. And that, in turn, has allowed other central banks a lot more room to either take on more accommodative stances or to just stay on hold. So uh, you know, even the ECB now expecting uh, not to raise rates at least till the end of this year before they were saying the end of summer. Uh, and as a result, a lot of the countries in Asia we expect will be able to cut rates. So India, we expect uh, another, another rate cut possibly. We're expecting a rate cut in Malaysia, three rate cuts in Indonesia for 100 basis points rate cuts in Philippines. So in general, a much uh, more supportive monetary policy uh, coming through for uh, the wider economy. And that, I think, chimes very well with what was said. We see that the risks and the excessive pessimism that was there at the turn of the year, the start of the year, might have been overdone. Uh, and now, with the Fed turning more dovish, other central banks being supportive, uh, fears about a very hard landing in China beginning to fade, because we did get a lot of questions on that from our clients. Uh, and the fact that oil prices are in the Goldilocks range, really, growth, the growth outlook should improve from here on. Right. So, so because of the interest rate outlook in particular, you're probably slightly more positive in the NDB. Um, Maybe, but, but, but marginally so. Marginally so, marginally so. Uh, yeah, no, we, we would agree broadly. Okay. Or just let me turn to you. Where, where's the Asia seeing growth, and, and what's your outlook for developing Asia? Um, so, um, first of all, it's, it's, it's great to be here. And uh, secondly, I mean, I, I, I look at the, um, the growth patterns in Asia-Pacific compared to the rest of the world. And as, as you said, I mean, uh, over 5% or almost 6% um, average growth is uh, two to three percent higher than we see in um, in the eurozone, in the U.S., and even more so in Latin America. And we look at the, um, the sort of the consumption patterns because, of course, we sell alcohol, so people have to drink stuff. Uh, and uh, Asia Pacific has uh, two very large closed economies: um, India and, and China. Uh, if you put that in perspective, um, in China. Um, Total um, spirits consumption is about 1.2 billion uh, nine-liter cases, of which um, imported spirits is 0.5%. Uh, and that is growing. So Diageo, we saw this year, we saw um, our um, volumes grow by 13% uh, in the first half of this year. So very strong. And that's both with imported spirits being Johnny Walker. So we see Johnny Walker as one of those brands where, in fact, I hadn't realized it, but... Uh, Asia Pacific could actually be the number one region for Johnny Walker uh, over the next year or two, beating, uh, beating the, uh, the Eurozone. That's five million uh, nine-litre cases, which is, which is not bad. It's reasonable drink, yes. Reasonable, yeah. reasonable. <laughs> of course, I, I always, like, always get that, you know, in, in, in victory you deserve it, in defeat you need it. So, uh, so that's quite handy. And, it, and in India, again, there's, there's a market of over 300 million nine-litre cases. And again, imported spirits is very small. We've taken a stance on domestic um, uh, consumption and domestic growth, so we've got a lot of distilleries in India because it is very close. There are 150% import tariffs. Uh, and in the same in, um, in China, we've taken considerable... We're, we're, the, we're the, um, the only international spirits operator to actually have um, sort of a, a concern in, in Baiju, and in fact, we've actually increased our stake in that over the last, uh, over the last month or so. So, I mean, actually, 6%. You'll take good. that. I'll take that. <laughs> take that, definitely. And best let me turn to you. The ADB is forecasting a slowdown in growth in Thailand. So, so like your, your, your take on the Thai situation, but also later on we'll broaden out to ASEAN because you're chairman of yes. ASEAN. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, 
although there is a slowdown, but the good news is that there's still some growth. Yes. That is one good thing. And the whiskey index is a clear indication. <laughs> <laughs> and I really like that. I'm a, I'm a faithful customer of Johnny Walker. <laughs> Well, I, I think I think when when Thailand takes the championships of uh, of the ASEAN this year, we we also wants to address the current situations and the trends in in, in Asia and Pacific. Too. So well, when we when we set the tones for our championship this year, the themes that we we want to pursue is to is what people you may also know advancing partnerships for sustainability. Mm -hmm. So instead of aiming high on economic prosperities and others, we probably want to keep the momentum of the previous chair, Singapore, that she did. Mm -hmm. And in these themes, you may see that there are, there are three key words in there. Firstly, is to advance ASEAN, mm -hmm. advance partnerships for <laughs> sustainability. Uh, the first key word is advance, to advance ASEAN. The second word is sustainability. And the last word is partnership. So these will be three things that will be the focus for Thailand championships for ASEAN. And then we talk about advance. As I have mentioned, we want to add on what the previous chair has done. During Singapore's championships, they're doing so many things on digital development. Mm. So that will be the thing that we will continue to do. So what we aim for ASEAN is that ASEAN will be digital ASEAN, uh, innovative ASEAN, and ASEAN Industries 4.0. And with that, I think we can be able to address with the challenges and changes that we are encountering now even the slowdown of economic trends and others. That is something. The second point, we want to focus on sustainability. And in terms of sustainability, is when we go back to the first point of advancing on digital development. In terms of uh, sustainability, we instead, not just only is trying to move ASEAN towards Internet of Things and Internet of Everything. But we will do sustainability of things and sustainability of everything. So the key issues of everything which, is, which, which could be run and could be served ASEAN regions as a sustainable region, that is something that we will do. Green finance, green economy, the others, you know, that is something that we will promote. But of course, the key to it is everything is, must be done on the basis of consolidated partnerships. And in terms of partnerships, we have two parts. Intra-ASEAN partnerships, among others, ASEAN countries. So we want to make sure that we can move together. ASEAN will be a seamless ASEAN through digital development. And we will focus on connectivity of ASEAN. And the main, three main things that we will refocus is firstly, digital connectivity. Secondly, physical connectivity, where we're going to establish road connections, railway connection, air connections, maritime connection. And with these two things, we hope that there is opportunities for ASEAN to prosper. And the last thing is people's to people's connectivity. We have to further encourage people's to people's connectivity. That is intra ASEAN partnership. But we also need, because as I have mentioned, we want to go digital, we want to, we want to go industrial 4.0. So we also need strategic partnership outside ASEAN. And that's the UK fits in all qualifications. And we also would like to welcome the British people to come. Uh, we set the tone that inside ASEAN, if we want to go far, we have to run together. If you want to go fast, you should run alone. 
but because we want to go fast, we will run together with others, ASEAN members, leaving no ones behind. And if we can also run with our strategic partner like the, the British friends, I think we would be able to run further. Okay, you, you touched on a lot there, the, the digital and, and, and technology change, which I think we'll address a bit later. I'd, li I'd like to, get, uh, to explore that a little further later. But first, can I turn to China specifically? And, and, and your forecast for growth is still pretty healthy for, for um, compared to most, but there are some observers, some economists who believe that China's growth rates are vastly overstated, some suggesting it's more likely to be around 4%. You know, but you've come out at six, six, six plus. You know, how confident are you that the, the growth rate you're forecasting will stand up to that sort of scrutiny? Also, uh, one of the things that uh, makes me feel good is that Maduro and I, <laughs> we're, we're on the same page on this. <laughs> but uh, so in general, I mean, uh, uh, again, uh, what we do see that uh, mm -hmm. this gradual growth moderation is, it's definitely feasible. I mean, uh, uh, one of the things is sort of the, the the ability of uh, the PRC government to support growth should it slow more than expected, um, both on the monetary front. Maduro already mentioned that uh, the, 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 less, the lower likelihood of um, rapid Fed rate hikes has sort of helped uh, helps uh, many of the region's economies, including the PRC. They also have space on the, on the fiscal side to, to support uh, if needed. What they've been doing is uh, uh, choosing those elements of policy support that uh, are less likely to generate uh, financial risks in the future. So, in particular, sort of uh, the most recently on the on the fiscal side, you know, they, they allowed they're allowing for more special bond issuance to finance infrastructure. So, when they there was actually a, a significant policy a, a shift in policy stance. Uh, so they, it was uh, tighter in the first three months, first three quarters of last year, but in the fourth quarter and continuing into this year, uh, both monetary and uh, fiscal policies have become more supportive. In part because they realize uh, that uh, conditions are, are are less positive, and so they've already put in things like you know personal income tax uh, uh, cuts, uh, VAT cuts, um, increased social spending, and again this uh, uh, allowing local governments to uh, issue special bonds to finance infrastructure, which helps because, uh, again, it, allow, it's, it's, uh, it can help reduce it uh, off-budget financing of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So they have that, uh, uh, the policy space to do that, which makes us uh, confident. Their, their goal is not to push growth higher than it is. <coughs> their goal is to avoid growth falling. And I, it's, it's really very feasible for them to hit uh, about you know two, six point two percent on average this year and next, which would uh, one one reason why we think that's a very likely uh, scenario is because the uh, the Chinese government has uh, indicated that they want to double uh, incomes by 2020, and an average of six point two percent this year and next will get them there. Hey, Matt, is, is the, the policy levers that China can and might employ yeah. also underpin Standard Chartered's fairly positive outlook for Chinese yes. growth. Yes, absolutely. I think it is a, it's a confluence of factors. I think the, uh, what we stress when we meet clients is that a lot of the slowdown that happened in China, as was very nicely shown in that chart, was because there was a uh, concerted attempt by the authorities to have some deleveraging in the economy, so to bring down the shadow banking sector. So uh, although a lot of people talk about the impact of the US-China trade tensions and what, what's that doing, really the slowdown was a result of internal decision making. And they obviously are able to reverse it if things are, uh, you know, something, uh, if, if, if they, they are worried. As of now, we don't think that they will require additional measures because they've already done a substantial two percentage points of GDP through the cuts that we've talked about. So definitely uh, expecting growth to be well uh, supported. And the fact that the global environment is not as uh, worrisome, maybe, as it was at the turn of last year, again, that should be supportive as well. Okay. Richard, again, are you seeing sort of policy shifts in China and potential for more policy shifts as underpinning your business and the, and the growth rates that we're looking at? Yes, I mean, so first of all, I think I've, I've been doing a lot of looking at yield curve spreads over the last four to five months and, uh, and looking at, you know, there, there's that 
checking, checking the Fed on a, on a daily basis in the Bank of England. Has it inverted yet? Yeah. Uh, and are we going to face a, a recession in sort of 12 to 18 months' time? Um, in China, it's interesting. You're talking about that slowdown. Um, if you look at the 10-year the and the three-month uh, Chinese bond um, spread, you actually see that about two years ago, there was a brief inversion. Yeah. And it sort of indicates in that, that point, uh, the central bank of China was, uh, was tightening monetary policy. Mm. Uh, and the same could be said in the US. You know, they started rate rises, was it the beginning of 2016? Mm. So a lot of that, you, you could see the slowdown actually coming. Um, the good thing is it's a slowdown rather than a recession because, uh, of course, China growth of over 6%, you're not going to get that. Um, what does that mean for, for us? Well, you know, maybe we're on a knife edge. Maybe that slowdown has, has, has happened in China. Maybe we're just waiting for that next sort of step in um, US-China trade tensions or even US-EU um, trade tensions, which could uh, potentially blow up everything in a wider, wider picture. But generally, I, I think, you know, um, we're seeing growth in consumption. Um, the market is still very closed. Um, if anything, the innovation in China is very much, for, for us, growth is very much on things like e-commerce, uh, where, I mean, we did, uh, we did some sort of um, Twitter training last week, and it was amazing quite how much um, Asia Pacific uses handhelds to, 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 to tweet mm. and, and do everything like that. So, of course, the next generation of, um, of buying your alcohol is, of course, on, on your iPhone yeah. or your pad. So, we're seeing growth like that in those sort of like new, new route to consumer. But also, because China is so huge, we're also seeing more traditional routes to access as, as we widen out our distribution with local players. So, I mean, based on the data, yes, yeah, it's, yes. it's yeah. looking okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ambassador, the, the, the report highlights the trade dispute, not just a potential escalation, but prolonged negotiations as being you know, key risks. How is Thailand positioning itself in the midst of the US-China trade? Well, uh, because, because in the context of ASEAN, as we are the chairs, so mm. I think this is, this is kind of a tough challenge for, yes. for us. Because the, the economic slowdown in China would, would affect the, uh, everyone in ASEAN regions, you know, and if it's further prolonged, uh, there will be some things that all ASEAN states must be able to prepare some measures to mitigate that thing. So that's why we are trying to uh, further foster uh, cooperation among ASEAN so that ASEAN would be able to have a self resilience mm -hmm. in a stronger sense. And one thing that we re resolve to make it happen during our chairmanship is just to try whatever we can to conclude the ASEP uh, within the year 2019 yes. as it was scheduled. And we have high hopes that we will be able to, to run that. If we can have ASEP and uh, cooperation in the regions in other framework, which can complement each other, uh, we believe that uh, interdependencies <coughs> among the region, intra-cooperation in the regions will be able to be uh, an effective tool that could sustain our economy. So, so the US-China trade tensions are potentially uh, a factor which will accelerate mm -hmm. ASEAN integration, which that's has right. come some way, but it's still a, a, mm -hmm. a, a way off. That's true. All right, and that's the position that Thailand is taking yes. in mm -hmm. current chairmanship. That, that's very interesting. Uh, uh, stick with the trade tensions, uh, Abdul, and, and you had a really interesting chart up there about you know, the biggest impact will be China if there's an escalation now, mm -hmm. as opposed to prolonged negotiations. So the escalation, China takes the biggest hit, US the next one, but there are potentially in developing Asia some winners from the redirection of trade. Where are the winners? Where should we be looking at for potential winners should the dispute escalate? So the analysis we, I, I put up on the board only looks at trade redirection. So it, what it looks at is, you know, uh, you will have the U.S. importing less from the PRC and the PRC importing less from the U.S. Some of that, uh, the, the, the importers who used to buy goods from the other country, they'll be looking elsewhere for suppliers. And so the biggest gainers are those who are, who have, uh, who sell again those products that are, uh, that compete with PRC goods or U.S. goods 
that are now subject to tariffs. And so uh, in the region, the, uh, the, the countries that gain the most would be uh, Vietnam's actually the, the biggest one. So when we first did it, we were, the effect looked a bit, and, and let me note that uh, because we didn't assume full trade redirection, that all of it will go elsewhere, we just assumed 50% trade redirection. The tool I showed you, you can actually change that assumption to, to a quarter or more. But uh, the, the gains are, are non-trivial for a country like uh, Vietnam. Again, sort of they, 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 they already sell um, products that compete directly with uh, uh, Chinese goods. In addition, though, I think the, uh, the, a bigger channel, potentially, is relocation of production. That, uh, um, and in, in which case, the question is if, if uh, firms start to think, OK, uh, doesn't work so well uh, to have uh, my, my factories in China, where do I relocate? And so there the question becomes, which of the economies in the region are you know, best positioned to attract that, those kinds of investments? And mm -hmm. so this, then it becomes a question of how good is your business climate, how good is infrastructure? Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that, those are the factors that will determine um, uh, you know, potential production redirection. And that's sort of happening already, isn't it? Because of rising wage growth in China and China going further up the value chain, Vietnam seems to be a huge beneficiary to date. Is that what you're, you're seeing in your model? Yeah, actually we conduct a research, a survey, we've been doing it for almost 10 years now of uh, firms that are based in the Pearl River Delta region, the PRD region. And uh, about five years ago, we started asking this question as to, are you looking to relocate? Are you looking to relocate in inland, in within China itself? Or are you trying to relocate outside? And uh, still, I think it's only about 10% of those firms which are saying, uh, we are planning to relocate. That number might change. We haven't done the survey this year yet so far. Uh, but uh, you know that might not, number might change because of all the trade tensions that's that's happened over the last year. But um, the number one destinations that we, when we ask people if you were to relocate out, where would you go? Would be Vietnam, Cambodia. Uh, it's really that region which which and and it's largely because of low cost, but also infrastructure proximity to China. And to some extent, a lot of people are also talking about the fact that the, the, there is a growing demand within those economies themselves. So, uh, so it's a combination not just of low cost, but it's also about whether they could actually sell within the country. Uh, so I think we, we are definitely seeing some suggestions of that. Yeah. Very happy to take your questions, by the way. So please um, start thinking about it. I'll bring you all in in a minute. Uh, we have some microphones that will run around. Uh, when you do ask a question, please just name and organisation you represent. But this consumer demand, you're picking this up, uh, I assume, across the region? Yes, across the region. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are winners and losers always. Yeah. Uh, there are some, there's some global challenges there, say in Korea, there's changes in um, what people consume. Uh, in Indonesia, you know, about four years ago, there was a... There was a change in import tariffs, which they effectively almost cut out um, foreign imports, as, as well as closing sort of 30% uh, of uh, beer stores. So yes. there was a challenge. Yes. But since then, it's become, you know, the, the problem's there. I mean, you, it's always very good if there's a model and you go, if you do that, this happens and it happens. You can then go back and actually argue the points. So in this case, we've, we've developed local production um, of spirits in Indonesia, that way avoiding the 150% import mm. tariffs, mm. bringing consumers in to, um, to, uh, to, 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 to brands that they're not normally associated with, uh, with emerging middle classes as well, which we're seeing uh, that ties in with that, and also the fact that, um, you know, so Asia saw, I think it saw the largest increase of high worth net worth individuals last year, so mm. very much playing in with that. Uh, the same in India, we saw there's been the shocks there before. Yes. So there was demonetization and there was a high wage balance yes. there. But, but since that's filtered through, then growth has resumed and picked up. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, gin craze. Who would have thought? So <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a gin craze going on, uh, which um, <laughs> is basically quite good for us. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that means that people wanted to drink gin. So they're tapping into that as well as whiskey and various other brands. <laughs> ASEAN countries clearly the most likely beneficiaries if there's any exit of production from China, Vietnam being in the top of the list it seems, but also Thailand would get a piece of that as well. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, well, uh, 
I think the business of business opportunities in in Thailand and ASEAN country is ample because because all of us wants to move move up. and uh, in ASEAN countries we starting to have a sort of a, a sort of the com complementarity schemes in terms of industries. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about ASEAN moving towards industry 4.0, it means that. ASEAN countries will have kind of like job differentiation that is will complement to each other mm -hmm. after that. So the business opportunity is ample, and because if we call that this is the age of Asia, you probably can imagine Asia is just like the aircraft taxiing and going up to the sky, <coughs> and this is the aircraft which flies by two wings. Moving on by two wings. One wing is India, the other wing is China, and ASEAN is the body of the aircraft. <laughs> yeah. So I would like to extend the invitations to all of you to consider running a business in a more comfortable way <laughs> in the body of the aircraft. <laughs> Don't miss an opportunity. <laughs> okay, open it up now to, to you for questions. Uh, again, uh, we'll bring a mic around. Uh, we'll go to Richard first. Name and organisation, please. Hello, it's yeah, Fine, Richard Lillison from Gas Asia. Um, in some ways, does the Belt and Road Initiative offset the issues of growth due to the um, trade disputes? Due to the trade disputes. Right. Does it offset the trade disputes? Does it ah, offset? So it's a plus, basically, for China and will underpin growth regardless of what happens in the trade dispute and stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I see uh, the Belt and Road Initiative as being really separate from what's happening to China's domestic economy. And in fact, uh, you know, it's a, I think a, it, it's a, what, what's driving that is, again, this desire to improve connectivity across the region. Um, uh, and, but if one is thinking about uh, uh, the context of, are they doing it in response to the, the local economy, uh, the domestic economy slowing? I think uh, you can tie it more closely to a potential oversupply in, uh, in uh, a particular sector. So, so the construction, for example, within, within the PRC, and uh, again, sort of exporting that capacity. But uh, as, as we've mentioned uh, uh, you know, now, the, there are other policy levers that can uh, support domestic growth uh, much better, including, again, so there's no lack of their ability to still uh, support the economy using more traditional tools like monetary and fiscal policy. Are you building in economic growth based on the Belt and Road Initiative? I know I, I would agree that I think that's a separate project, really. The and and if you if you see the outward direct investment from China kind of fell a little bit when they started focusing again inwards uh, at at stabilizing the growth story. So so it is a separate project. It's I think more of a medium long term project where they're looking at more south south trade and integration across and, and not just south south. But when I say south south, I mean intra emerging market. Um, but that's a more long-term project. I think this was uh, the responses for the growth stabilization. And I completely agree with Abdullah in terms of the fact that what they would like to do is to double the per capita income by 2020. They only need to make sure that growth stays above this 6.2% for the next two years. And for that, I think they've got the domestic levers. The Belt and Road has taken a few publicity hits, if nothing else. Uh, in the last six months or so, you know, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, poor, poor proposing things. Is there enthusiasm in Thailand for engaging in Belt and Road vision? Well, actually, it's we engaged in this before China has introduced the ideas of Belt and Road. Because I have mentioned that one priority is that has been always in the priorities of ASEAN is connectivity. Uh, in the past 15 years, ADB will be able to clarify this. that. Most of the money was, was made uh, for public investments to establish a fiscal connection in the regions. If you travel into Southeast Asia by now, you will see that we would be able to drive from Myanmar on the Indian, Oce Indian Oceans through Vietnam, across Thailand, through Pacific Ocean. 
that is a new thing. And the fiscal connectivity is not just limited on road transportation. It's also air links, maritime linkage. And we have to expand that. And now the new things coming up is high-speed train networks, which by the years 2000s, uh, there will be the networks of high-speed trains that connect China to Southeast Asia will be completed. And by that time, the whole economic scenarios and development in that region will completely change because everything, every mode of transportation and connectivity will be interconnected. Uh, the flows of goods, the flows of people, the flows of capitals will change in Southeast Asia regions. And one good thing that would address your questions, I think this is one thing that ASEAN can play a part in terms of contains or reduce the tensions between the U.S. and China uh, in terms of uh, Belt and Road Initiatives. Because we are neutral and both China and the U.S. are our friends. As we attach to the concept of ASEAN centralities, whereas all the networks of Belt and Road also boils down to Southeast Asia, I think we would be able to play, to play that role. Richard, are you building in Belt and Road growth uh, into your modelling? Uh, not only that, but also the Made in China. So that, that, that idea that China wants to break out of that middle income um, trap and actually get the same per capita income as Japan and Korea and grow from there, which works for us because there will be that net wealth, there will be that uh, demand for, for products that they haven't seen before, there will be that need for, for Johnny Walker. Uh, I mean, I was just Johnny Walker grew by 40% last year in China. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's still a long way, it's still probably about a, a thousand cases less than what it was before the corrupt, pre corruption. Yeah. Uh, Boom, but, but it's getting there. So that expansion actually, it does work. Um, so yes, I mean, that's it. I mean, globally as well, like you said, the knock-on effects. Um, I was looking at uh, Latin America, and Brazil seems to have been a beneficiary of um, EU-China sort of uh, trade tensions mm -hmm. uh, with, with exports to China, now with Brazil being the number one uh, exporting country, particularly with, I think it was soy last year, 80% yes. yeah. mm -hmm. volumes out there. So. Yeah. That, that's good for us in the Brazilian economy because that grows it from the, the deepest recession it had since the 30s. Okay, uh, microphone up here, please. James is soon. <coughs> First of all, Ambassador, I, I'm pleased to report that Jardine Matheson um, is taking many seats in the fuselage of the plane. We have, <laughs> we, we, we have businesses I'm front in. Though, James, with you. I'm front, well, yeah. <laughs> First we, class. We have, we have, we're very happy to have businesses in all the ASEAN countries. But um, seriously, the um, political stability is clearly um, not unimportant to the uh, Asian development outlook. There are many elections coming. We've just had one um, in your country in Thailand. So I'd just be very interested, Michael, if we're allowed yeah, to yes, ask this question, yes. um, to ask the ambassador for a just a quick update on where things stand on the Thai election, when you expect to have a new government in place, and I mean, if anybody else has got any comments on, on other risks coming from elections, it'd be yes. interesting to hear them. Mm. Yes, thank you, thank you, Lassa Soos. From, from the information in the social media, mm. I understand that everything would lead to the, to the understanding that there's kind mm. of like the uncertainties and probably the risks uh, on some things in terms of political development. But, but if we look back before, uh, before we have these elections, uh, Thailand's gone through kind of like turbulent mm -hmm. for a long time. And so then we have this present government. And there is a new constitution. And in the constitution, because we really want to become a full democratic country, and we also want to, trans, to trans, transform Thailand into a rule-based country. So the electoral system was designed to take every vote counted. Uh, and with that, the electoral, electoral system is really complicated. Uh, it's not uh, winner takes all, uh, mm -hmm. winner part of Pass the polls at all. So all the all the votes would be counted. So this is the new things in terms of electoral systems. And when we look back again before 2014, 
24th of March that we have general elections. Previous to that, there was speculation that there won't be any elections because the militaries will do this and that, or the present governments will do this and that. But finally, we have a peaceful elections. Uh, usually, in the previous elections, the part, people's participation in the election is just about 40 to 65 percent, that maximums in the recent history. But for this particular elections on the 24th, people's participation is over 80 percent. Over, over 80 percent. Overseas elections for the Thai community is here in London, which we run by post. People's voters also make a record. Usually it's in the previous elections, it's just show, they just register to vote just less than 5,000. These years, people registered to vote nearly 8,000. And people show up 91% to vote. So in terms of political participation and awareness, I think it's also good. During the campaign period, uh, people say that it would be limited. But you can see it's from social media and others that the campaign was done freely. Of course, this is usual situations when you have elections. Difference in opinions, and because now we have social media, uh, I, think, I think this is usual that so people would see is that now Thailand fall into conflict again. But for me, I think this is usual. That if you are this Thai people's will, this is our fashion. We want to quarrel, but finally we can come up with peaceful solution <coughs> as always. Now the point of uh, and, and uh, directions of uh, the elections, we are going towards the uh, final counting. Uh, although there's uh, information in the social media, so of the fraud, some irregularities. Uh, that's simply is because of the complicated uh, electoral system. But it is not too difficult to, for the national elections committees to clarify and explain to the people because everything was already stipulated in the constitutions and uh, any paper. After that, you can also see this is a crucial juncture of the Thai societies. This year is not this very auspicious one. Not just only be we are ASEAN chairs. We have a new, we have a fresh elections. We turn, we come back to full normalcy or democratic path. We're going to have a new government, and on this May we're going to coronation. So a new leaderships will be formally crowned. And then all of us in Thailand, we set tones to move our country forward. Uh, and in terms of the first values, because we are share of ASEAN, that will also help. Because we have to make sure that we would be able to run ASEAN business gracefully and successfully. The timetable, when will the government The timetable is yeah. the new governments will be in place uh, by June by June, no later than July, and after that, everything is moving on. Okay. Any other views on elections? We've got Indonesia elections coming up uh, in a couple of weeks, in fact, and that obviously creates uncertainty, impossible policy change, what sort of a risk? Uh, you mean Indonesia or India? Indonesia, uh, India. Well, there was India, there's Indonesia yeah. elections coming so up. So I don't, I don't think, I think for Indonesia we've got a fairly, I think the, the, the polls at least suggest that the incumbent is, is most likely to come back, so it's not seen as a very, uh, controversial uh, election. I think of of that region uh, and the several elections that that were happening in that region. I think India was at the turn of the year seen to be the one which was the most uncertain, right? Because uh, there was the the, the fear that uh, the current uh, government, uh, which has a full majority in the lower house of parliament, the BJP government, would actually could potentially even lose its majority. There was this. Uh, concern, especially amongst foreign investors in particular. And so you did see a period where uh, investment flows into India did slow down. But uh, more recently, actually support for uh, the current Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, has gone up, especially after the, the recent um, uh, maybe hostilities, for want of a better word, between India and Pakistan. So there is a lot of support for the government. And there is the expectation that 
uh, his government will be back uh, after the elections. So the elections are from uh, 11th of April to 19th of May in seven phases. 900 million people will vote. Um, and the results will be announced on 23rd of May. Um, the expectation is he will come back as prime minister with his government, but with a smaller majority in the lower house of parliament. I think that's pretty much priced in. So. Uh, you priced in those sort of election results. Uh, yeah, so Kerry to get back I, in. I think the elections election. are interesting in that they, they're another manifestation of uh, the importance of uncertainty. So yeah. I mean, they, they, by their nature, uh, elections generate economic policy, policy uncertainty, but including economic policy uncertainty. I think uh, all I wanted to add was that uh, I think the key for all these countries is that, and, and so first of all, you, you do see, uh, Maduro mentioned it, that you do see in many of these elections sort of a wait and see approach, uh, a, a decline in, uh, in investment prior. And what's really critical is that, um, that the elections don't prolong the uncertainty, that there's uh, a quick um, uh, resolution of, uh, of that uncertainty, that the government gets formed uh, quick, uh, more uh, quickly rather than uh, uh, more slowly um, so that uh, the investment can finally take place. Mm. So, yeah, Richard, to you? Yes, I mean, i go back to the fact that in the, in the global picture, um, Asia Pacific looks a bastion of sensibi sensibility. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I've, I've, so working in a global business, I've, um, I've seen the changes, the political changes in Brazil. So at one point there were three finance ministers over a year. I mean, trying to work out what they were doing was very complicated. Uh, the same, you know, the fallout in um, in Venezuela. I mean, yeah. we have operations there. What do you do? Uh, and then, and then in the UK itself, uh, do we have a government in name only? Are we going to have a general election? What's going to happen? You know, anything like that? So actually. When you look at it, of course, there's, there's always challenges. Mm. So, I mean, uh, for instance, um, in Asia Pacific, there's, there's dry days. So, in mm. India, during elections, there are dry days. Mm. The evidence suggests that probably doesn't drive down alcohol consumption because people <laughs> front load, yeah. uh, <laughs> buy in, uh, and, and, the, and the same in Thailand. But um, it, it's very much, you know, touch wood, based, based on the data, as a technician, based on yeah. the data. It, it feels a lot, lot, I feel a lot happier when I deal with Asia Pacific. <laughs> okay. Good point, good point. Question, this gentleman here, just in front, yeah, there you go. And then we'll come to you. Thank you. Uh, another question for the ambassador, actually. Um, ASEAN, I note that the working language is English. How long do you think it will be before Mandarin threatens that, or do you think that's a possibility in the near or distant future? <laughs> I have a second question f for the panel. Uh, which is around um, the, the, the growing youth demographic across the region and how you talk very much about growth and how, how will this be uh, uh, generated in terms of job creation and, and what sort of skills do you anticipate <laughs> looking into your crystal balls will be needed? Will it be the creative industries that help solve these problems or which sectors do you anticipate will be the, 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 the the fastest growing or longer growing? L lots to cover there. So, <laughs> language of ASEAN. My question, ASEAN yeah. will remain English. Will remain English. English. For sure. Okay. But of course, the new, new generation in ASEAN states, uh, nearly all of the families encourage their children to study Mandarin. Uh, my son also have a great Mandarin. Uh, and people in Thailand, for the younger generation, they are very interested in, in Mandarin. The key is to it that is that as long as the computer language is still dominated by English, it will remain the official language of ASEAN. Okay. And the demographic thing you touched on some of the, the, the you said earlier, there is a, a, you know, a demographic play in terms of longer term yeah. growth. Yeah, I mean, actually, we've, we've looked at this in some detail because we, we've put out a report called Aging in Asia a while ago, and then we've updated it more recently as well when we've looked at our long-term forecast. So I think it's a very, it's, it's actually a great question because uh, the two big threats that I see to otherwise a very positive Asia growth story uh, really come from uh, uh, technology and, and anti-globalization. Now, technology ne not necessarily needs to be negative for countries, but unlike previous general purpose technology such as electricity or steam, en steam engines, anybody could use it. You didn't have to be educated. Digital technology, for it to be useful and beneficial, you have to have a certain level of basic level of education or skills to be able to benefit from it. And 
so I, I, we recently put out a report on this where we've looked at which countries in the emerging market world are actually well placed to utilize these digital technologies. Countries like the Philippines, uh, you know, Thailand, they're much better. Uh, countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, they really need to ramp up Nigeria amongst the other uh, emerging market countries. They need to ramp up to do more. Uh, just to give you a sense, uh, a very quick anecdote, um, the average years of, years of education in India is still only six years, compared to something like 14 years in the UK or the US. It's a huge population, uh, and it's a young population. Um, and you're right, uh, you know, they will have to provide about 100 million jobs, additional jobs by 2030. For that, you need the right skills. If you look at surveys such as the Manpower Group Survey, which does the talent uh, mismatch, India comes on quite high in terms of uh, the mismatch between uh, skills and jobs available. Mm. So vocational training has to be improved, education, upskilling, how do you use this technology? Because otherwise, there's the risk that you've got a lot of automation happening because you don't get the labor skills. So that is the key risk for me. Uh, and I think that's a really, thank you for raising that point because it's, it's what we highlight as one of the big risks. People aren't paying enough attention to the need for skill upgrade. We are just about out of time. So I want to try to get one more question in, if I may. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Rebecca Naden from the Overseas Development Institute. Um, we've heard a lot of, about, obviously, political and financial risk, but what about um, climate um, and natural hazard related uh, risk, particularly on climate risk in relation to transitions from um, fossil fuel to, to low carbon economies in the region and also from um, the increasing uh, frequency intensity of uh, natural hazard related disasters. So yeah, so the theme chapter, we, in every Asian development outlook there is a, a chapter that uh, looks at develop, a particular development issue and now th this particular report does uh, look at the issue of uh, um, uh, the risk arising from disasters relating to natural hazards. So one of the interesting facts there is that, you know, while developing Asia accounts for roughly half of the global population, f um, more than four out of five people who are affected by um, uh, natural disasters uh, actually live in the region. So it's uh, disproportionately uh, affected. Um, more than that, though, is uh, risks are rising, and th that's there's a confluence there between uh, an increasing frequency in natural hazards, partly related to climate change, but also um, that ties up with uh, socioeconomic changes. So, uh, disasters are the confluence of hazards, exposure to these hazards, and vulnerability, and. Um, you are getting, more, because of uh, socioeconomic development, you have more and more people living on coasts, and so more people are exposed. And so uh, we highlight, we, we, we show uh, the, the rising risks and costs, and we highlight the uh, various policies that are needed to address that. So um, I, I'd invite you to read the report, and I'm happy to chat more about that at some point. Look, I'm afraid we are out of time. In fact, we've gone over time, so I'm going to have to wrap it there. But I'm hoping our, our, our guests will join us uh, along with you for uh, a bite to eat next door. Thank you all very much for a fascinating conversation. As you can tell, clear, huge amount of interest and much more we could explore. Please join me in thanking my speakers, Abdul Abiyad, Madhur Jha, Richard Grenfell-Hill, and His Excellency, the Ambassador. <laughs>